A decade ago, you could buy a copy of Windows for a normal price, or you could buy a copy of Windows for like twice as much that had extra features like the ability to join a domain, uh, support for more RAM, or even the ability to set a video as your desktop background. Ooh. But did you get any additional performance for your money? Fair question, and one that was asked many times, only to find out that no, no, in fact, you did not. But what about Windows Server operating systems? Surely, a $1,000 version of Windows would have some kind of under-the-hood performance tweaks, right? In today's video, we're gonna find out. We now have awesome posters available for Linus Tech Tips, Tech Quickie, and Channel Super Fun. Check them out at the link in the video description. Okay, so if we're measuring the performance of two different pieces of software, the last thing we want is some kind of a hardware bottleneck. So we're using a balls to the wall configuration. We've got a 5960X eight core processor from Intel. We've got an X99 Deluxe two motherboard from Asus, 128 gigs of quad channel DDR4 memory from G-Skill, a GTX Titan XP from Nvidia, an X540 10 gigabit NIC from Intel, and finally, for our boot drive, we are using Corsair's latest MP500 NVMe PCI Express SSD. Then I set up like a little dock so that with two separate installs on two separate drives of Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016, I could go through exactly asterisk, the same setup procedure down to the order of reboots and the order of application and driver installs to create the same basic state for both of these operating systems. Then anytime I'm measuring performance of something like rebooting, for example, or a game, if I have to screen capture, I'm using the HDMI pass-through of this BenQ monitor going to an AVIO Epifan capture card over to a separate computer so nothing that I'm doing affects the performance of the system whatsoever. No XSplit, no nothing like that. So at this point, I've actually finished running all of the Windows 10 numbers and you guys are joining me for the exciting part where we compare Windows Server 2016 and find out if it can blow Windows 10 out of the water or not. So we got our screen cap going. We got our first benchmark. Wow, here it goes. The Ida cache and memory benchmark. Wow. Some of these are like down to the point decimal place of a gigabyte per second identical. So our first result is in. And it looks like pretty much within margin of error, uh, the performance is the same. Let's keep going. Time for everybody's favorite benchmark, Cinebench. 1371. Okay, pass mark, CPU mark. Whoa, that was exciting. We are a little lower on the server operating system. Let's go ahead and log that. And move on to disk mark. Okay, so uh, disk mark results are in and things are getting pretty boring. We come in a little bit lower on the server 2016 machine, but not really in like a big way or anything like that. Okay. Sorry. Oh, so that's, uh, that's the Addo results. Wow. Pretty similar. Maybe gaming will be a performance revelation. Okay, first game benchmark. Ashes of the Singularity, 4K high, DirectX 12. Here we go. Show me the big difference. In three minutes and 15 seconds. So curiously, Ashes of the Singularity did have a significant performance difference, but Server 2016 was much worse than Windows 10. See how Rise of the Tomb Raider does. 
Okay. Last benchmark. Doom at 4K. Ultra. So far, gaming is not looking good for server 2016. Okay then, so outside of games, where we saw a server take a bit of a beating actually, they perform pretty much the same within margin of error. But this shouldn't be much of a surprise to anyone who's familiar with the term kernel. So the kernel is the very core of the operating system that's responsible for memory management and for allowing the hardware itself to interact with other pieces of software and drivers and vice versa. So Microsoft actually reuses fundamentally the same kernel between their server operating systems and their consumer operating systems. And this has been the case ever since Windows XP, where an MS-DOS based kernel got replaced by the Windows NT kernel. And the advantages of doing this were several. So it streamlined development while dramatically improving the stability of the consumer product. I mean, what was the point, when you really get down to it, of spending extra to maintain two parallel kernels so that one of them could be good and one of them could be, like, kind of unstable? It also dramatically improved interoperability. Have you ever noticed that a driver or a software application that runs on Windows Vista generally ran on Windows 7 without too many hiccups? That's because they're based on a very similar version of the Windows kernel. So what are the differences? Some can be easily reversed, like Control-Alt-Delete to sign into a server operating system, or pretty animations on your you know, windows when you drag them around on the consumer ones. Some of them are artificially imposed, like RAM limitations, no remote desktop connection, no domain connectivity for home editions, and some of them actually come from third-party developers who might lock down their software from running on non-server versions, so our data replication software is an example of this, or even from hardware companies who don't want their hardware running on non-validated versions of Windows. So the onboard Wi-Fi on this board, for example, even with a cheat through Device Manager manually pointing it at the driver file, simply refused to work. But the biggest difference comes down to the massive amount of code that goes into adding features that would have little to no value to the average home consumer. So things like uh, enterprise networking functionality or the ability to nest virtualized operating systems within other virtualized operating systems, virtualization -ception. So the bad news here then is if you spend $1,000 on your operating system, uh, you won't get any performance benefit. The good news though is that for $100, or even less if you're the Linux type, you are already getting the most out of your hardware. So, congratulations. Squarespace. I don't know why they call it Squarespace, because you could build your website any shape you want. It could even be a square or even a rectangle. Yes, my friend, square or rectangle. But what all Squarespace sites have in common is they look gorgeous and they work across any device you could want. And they make it easy to build. They offer live chat and email support 24 seven. It's inexpensive starting at only 12 bucks a month. And every website comes with a ton of great features including commerce, cover pages, which allows you to have a beautiful one page online presence in minutes, support for Apple news format. So you can have a Squarespace blog module and access like millions of potential readers. And the best part is you don't have to take my word for it. You can start a trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. Then use offer code LTT to get 10% off your first purchase. So thanks for watching this video, guys. If you disliked it, hit that button. If you liked it, hit that button. Check out our other videos here, subscribe. Also check out where to buy the stuff we featured today. I don't, Windows, I guess? At the link to Amazon in the video description, join our forum and I think that pretty much, oh right, t-shirts. We have t-shirts. And we have other videos. I did this completely out of order.